Planetary scientists and Elon Musk agree that the main goal of human space exploration is to turn humanity into a multi-planetary species. Establishing a self-sustaining human presence on Mars is key to achieving this goal. But how? In situ Resource Utilization, or IRSU for short, is a critical piece of the puzzle that will enable people on Mars to establish long-term outposts and become truly self-reliant. The roadmap for sustained human exploration of Mars includes four steps. Step 1. Crewed missions to the Martian surface. Step 2. Crewed missions to Mars with relatively small 10 to 20 person crews that will establish the first human presence on the planet. Step 3. Advanced infrastructure development to support planned community growth. And lastly, step 4. A transition to a fully self sufficient state on Mars. To become a self sufficient state, however, will require clever management of important resources such as propellants, life support, power generation, radiation, and rocket exhaust shielding, among other things. Doing these things properly properly will reduce the required risk, launch mass, and cost for human and robotic space exploration. The most valuable resource on Mars for ISRU is the huge amount of water ice. Water will of course be needed for things like life support and agriculture, and through electrolysis, it will also be used to produce hydrogen and oxygen for use in fuel cells and rocket engines. The management of Martian water ice helps the development of a self-sustaining civilization since you no longer need to transport water from Earth to Mars. This is why it's a top priority for future missions to Mars to analyze and understand everything they can about water ice. The planetary scientists who have written a paper about this are focusing on an assessment of the first uncrewed flights to Mars. They want to mark where the ice resources are, as well as the methods and equipment that might be needed to extract and process the ice in order to support future human exploration. Sustained human travel and survival on Mars is a challenging goal that will need expertise on various topics such as on-site construction, infrastructure planning and development, communication capabilities, power systems, human health and safety considerations, among others. According to the group of scientists, all these issues must be addressed as early as the first uncrewed missions. The first uncrewed starships to land on Mars should be strategically dedicated to resource prospecting, infrastructure development, and technology demonstration before human arrival. The scientists hope that these early missions will showcase the ability to land human-scale landers on Mars and provide the opportunity to figure out the best potential landing sites for the eventual human Mars base. The flights will also provide the opportunity to test high risk items that are critical to ISRU and long-term human settlement early, and they can autonomously construct basic infrastructure components such as roads, landing pads, and protective beams. For the purposes of their article, the planetary scientists made a few assumptions regarding SpaceX's capabilities. The scientists first assume that initially at least two uncrewed starships will be launched to Mars. These uncrewed vehicles have the capability of landing within close proximity of each other at one landing site, or can land in separate regions of Mars if exploration is needed to select the final landing site for the crewed missions. The arrival of starships on Mars could also be staggered by nearly two months so that landing site assessment can be performed with data returned from the first starship before deciding on the final landing site for the subsequent starship vehicles during a given launch window. These first uncrewed starships should remain on the surface of Mars indefinitely and serve as infrastructure for building up the human base. Launch windows from Earth to Mars occur approximately every 26 months when the Earth and Mars are optimally aligned for interplanetary travel with maximum speed and minimal propulsion costs. So the next wave of starships can be launched at the next best opportunity. The second wave of launches would include two or more uncrewed vehicles plus at least two crewed starships. All of these vehicles can land at the preferred landing site for the construction of the human Mars base. Starship launches would then continue at each subsequent launch opportunity. Optimally, the total number of landed vehicles will double at a minimum with each consecutive opportunity, with a to-be-determined split between uncrewed and crewed vehicles. Starship will serve as the lander for both crewed and uncrewed crewed missions, customizing the payload volume depending on the mission. Yep, that's the modern-day Noah's Ark. The planetary scientists believe that, given its expected payload capacity, the stainless steel giant will be able to transport the necessary equipment to support sustained human exploration, enabling the eventual establishment of cities on Mars. Elon has previously outlined how SpaceX missions to Mars will utilize in-space propellant transfer. In this case, the Super Heavy booster launches Starship into the Earth's orbit, where it is refilled with methane and oxygen by additional tanker flights from Earth. Tankers are starships that carry propellant as their only payload. The boosters and tankers then return to the launch site for reuse as the refilled starship vehicle begins its journey to the surface of Mars. Refilling starship in orbit basically resets the rocket equation, allowing for large payloads to be transported to the Moon and Mars. Starship is also capable of returning crew and cargo from Mars to Earth. The vehicle is refilled with propellants on Mars by using local resources processed through a surface propellant production plant. Starship then launches from Mars and conducts a direct 
direct return to Earth. Once humans first arrive on Mars, there will already be at least two cargo starships on the surface. The second wave of missions can include two starships carrying crew, plus additional cargo starships. The human starships will have something close to 1,100 cubic meters of front space, most of which will be pressurized for human habitation, an 800 cubic meter liquid oxygen tank, and a 600 cubic meter methane tank with a stainless steel structure. The liquid oxygen and methane tanks could later become pressurized living space on the surface of Mars. The planetary scientists recommend that these first crewed starships each have about 10 to 20 people on board, with an additional 100 plus metric tons of available cargo mass per starship. Cargo carried on these flights will include additional equipment required for human health and productivity during the transit to Mars and on the Martian surface. These vehicles will also carry fully operational hardware needed to support the human Mars base, which is likely to include equipment for power production, water extraction, pre-prepared landing pads, radiation shielding, dust control equipment, and exterior shelters for humans and equipment. Humans will most likely live on Starship for the first few years on Mars until additional habitats are constructed, so the radiation risk must be assessed and treated accordingly, with equipment planned to support this initial infrastructure. The first wave of uncrewed Starship vehicles can also be relocated or repurposed when needed to support the people on the surface. These vehicles will be valuable assets for storage, habitation, and as a source of refined metal and components. For some of us, this changes the whole concept of what initial life on Mars will look like, and we love it. Since a sustained presence of humans on Mars depends heavily on ISRU, a key objective for the first uncrewed Starship missions is to confirm the presence of water ice and other desired resources and characterize their deposits. This work will serve to either validate the selection of the initial landing site as satisfactory for human landing, or provide valuable information to consider moving the human landing site to a different location. In their white paper, the group of planetary scientists described multiple uses of water for ISRU and a suggested payload for characterizing the distribution and properties of near-surface water ice for ISRU. We recommend reading that article for a more in-depth look into the scientists' awesome suggestions for the water ice ISRU process. In addition to ISRU considerations, the scientists also outlined additional high-priority objectives for the first two uncrewed Starship missions to optimize the development of the human base on Mars. These tasks include deploying power infrastructure, characterizing the local environment at the landing site, implementing radiation shielding, food growth experiments, excavation and drilling demonstrations, pre-positioning of supplies, and assessing dangers to human life during surface operations. For environmental characterization, the scientists recommended a basic weather station to measure atmospheric and surface temperatures, wind speed and direction, atmospheric dust content, atmospheric pressure, and radiation levels. This will be necessary to fully understand the environmental conditions expected for future missions. Surface properties such as trafficability, geomorphology, and geotechnical properties of the surrounding landscape should be assessed to optimize future infrastructure developments such as roads, landing pads, and habitats. Radiation shielding is another high-priority requirement to guarantee human safety on the Martian surface. Astronauts will need adequate radiation shielding while working and living inside the Starship on Mars, and will also require radiation protection when working outside the Starship. For example, outdoor protected areas to conduct maintenance activities, laboratory work, and transit between different starships or facilities are required. The ability for humans to grow their own food on Mars will be a major milestone in the journey towards us becoming self-sustaining on the Red Planet. Food production and processing are super dependent on environmental conditions, which are variable between sites. Growing plants experimentally will be necessary to assess the effects of various conditions such as high carbon dioxide levels, low light, low water and nutrient levels, pollination efficiency, and the effects of low pressure and magnetic fields on plant growth and crop productivity. Most of these harsh Martian conditions aren't that terrible for crop productivity and can be compensated for within a greenhouse environment. Hydroponics will also be tested on Mars, building on hydroponic food production research on the ISS with the vegetable production system. Now all we have to do is wait and see what Elon thinks of this unexpected detailed blueprint of the Mars mission and whether or not he incorporates these ideas into SpaceX's exploits. Until next time, welcome to the future.